come and worship our holy God, to worship Christ, the one who rose from the dead, who is alive, who is seated today at the right hand of the Father, the one who intercedes for us, who hears our prayers and even prays for us. And so it is to Christ that we come today. It is to Christ that we can come with a sense of expectation, a sense of need, knowing that as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And so I invite you to open to the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to read our text this morning, and then we'll pray together. Luke chapter 9, our text will be Luke 9, verse 27 through 36. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 27. Following this scene where the disciples confess that Jesus is the Christ, following this conversation where Jesus explains his upcoming suffering and death and resurrection, and then what that means for his followers is they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. Jesus says this in verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, He took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Lord Jesus, we do come to you as our Savior, our mediator, our friend, We ask that you would do for us what you did for the disciples on that day. Not that we need or can expect the same vision in this life. But Lord, we need you to minister to our hearts. We need you to teach us. We need you to strengthen our faith the way you did theirs. So I pray that you would open our our ears, open our hearts, open our eyes, as it were, to behold your glory this morning. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, I was born in the state of Florida. I don't remember living there. Lived for a few short years in Missouri uh, when I was very, very young. For a few short years when I was first married uh, in Wisconsin. But most of my life, I've lived here in the state of Kansas. And I love it. I love the state of Kansas. There truly is no place like home. As much as I travel, go to different places, even different countries, I love coming back to Kansas. Despite what people may say, if they've only driven down I-70... I really do believe Kansas is a beautiful place to live. However, as much as I love Kansas, I do have to admit mountains are awesome. And we don't have any, do we? Mountains are an amazing aspect of God's creation. Mountains make you feel small. And these mountains, they can be seen from miles away. If you are taking that I-70 route, you're out there in what I think is really a not pretty part of Colorado. And you can see the mountains in the distance, and they're growing larger and larger, and it whets your, your anticipation for whatever it is you're going to do, if you're going to camp or hike or ski or even just drive through. The, these mountains are really glorious, and I, I love it when the sun is setting or the sun is rising, how the mountains truly reflect th- this amazing depth of color, and you really see God's glory in the mountains, You not only see God's glory in the mountains as you just look at them and see how majestic and impressive they are, you can also see God's glory from the mountains. If you've ever climbed a mountain, you've been up on the summit, you can look across and see things you can never see when you're standing at sea level. I love soaking in the views from the top of the mountains. It really is breathtaking. But in Scripture, we don't just see glory in the mountains, and we even see more than just glory from the mountains, 
As you read through both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we actually see glory on the mountains. It is often on a mountaintop where God reveals himself to his people. We see it in the Old Testament in Exodus 3 as Moses is on a mountain. He encounters a burning bush, and the very presence of God is there. And as Moses encounters the glory of God on the mountain, God speaks to him. There's this moment of revelation. We see it later on in Exodus chapter 19 as Israel gathers at that same mountain after they've been rescued from from slavery in Egypt and, and after they've crossed the Red Sea. They're gathered together at Mount Sinai to receive this covenant from God. And they see the glory of God manifest on the mountain. The mountain is wrapped in smoke. There's thunder and lightning and earthquake. And the the whole mountain is is sort of wrapped in this cloud. And then as Israel, trembling down at the bottom of the mountain, sees all of this, they hear the voice of God speaking to them. God speaks to them and gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. And then here in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 9, once again we find... This theme, this display of God's glory on a mountain as Jesus is transfigured in the presence of Peter, James, and John. And then once again, on the mountain, the glory of God is seen, and then God speaks. God speaks. Peter, James, and John are given this glimpse. They're given a taste of glory, a literal mountaintop experience that was meant to make an an imprint on their minds and their hearts. It was meant to to tattoo on their souls, as it were, this awareness of what the glory of Christ really means. It's a vision that would serve to encourage and strengthen their faith. The point of this morning's message is that the glory of Christ is the fuel for faith. It's this vision of who Jesus is, this understanding of his power, his majesty, his goodness, his glory. As we behold the glory of Christ, it fuels our Faith. When our faith is weak, when our mind is plagued by doubts and by fears and by questions, when we feel discouraged, when we feel spiritually cold, what the doctor orders for us in that moment, the medicine that we need, is to behold the glory of Christ, to see him for who he truly is. So I want to walk through this story, sort of break down this scene into a a few different key parts, and then we'll draw out some implications for us at the end. As we look at this story, we started actually in verse 27, and despite how your editors of your Bible may have put some headings, I think it's helpful to connect verse 27 to the rest of the story. In verse 27, we find a gracious promise. Look at this gracious promise that Jesus makes. He says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This brings up a very important interpretive question. This is a verse that a lot of people wrestle with, and there's many different opinions about it. What exactly is Jesus referring to in verse 27? When he says they will see the kingdom of God, what does that mean? Well, there's a number of of different options, and we usually don't dig this deep into all the different interpretive questions, but I think it's useful today to do that because this passage often causes people to stumble. So there's at least five different ways we can interpret this, and I'm just going to run through them briefly. The first option is that Jesus might be referring to, he could be referring to the second coming, that he's saying there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God, meaning until I return, until the second coming. So some will interpret this passage its way and therefore point to this verse as an example of a failed prophecy. Obviously, these men are all dead and Jesus hasn't come back yet. So some will conclude that Jesus was either himself deceived, that he was mistaken, that Jesus got it wrong, or that he was a deceiver, that he was a liar, that he was a false prophet. But Jesus is no liar. Psalm 1830 says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. 1 Peter 2.22 says of Christ that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus is no liar, neither is Jesus a failure. Isaiah 46.9 says, I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. God never tries and fails. God never plans to do something and then fails to carry it out. The Son of God never lies and he never fails. 
This cannot be referring to the second coming. Besides, the way that this is phrased, when he says there are some standing here who will not taste death until, that implies that some of them who saw would actually die after the event Jesus is referring to. So if Jesus is referring to the second coming, that can't work because the saints will not die after Jesus comes, after he establishes the kingdom, after the resurrection. There will be no more death for his redeemed after his return. Jesus isn't referring to the second coming. On top of that, if Jesus were a failed prophet, if he were a false prophet who made this bold prediction that ended up falling through, why do you think Matthew and Mark and Luke would all include the same? Why would they all put the spotlight on this promise if it was a failure, if it didn't come true. That's the sort of story that they would have been embarrassed about, right? That's the sort of thing you try to cover up if you're trying to start a new world religion. (laughs) So it doesn't make sense that, that Jesus is referring to the second coming. And it seems obvious that they, the first hearers who helped to author some of these books, they understood Jesus to mean something different than the second coming. So when Jesus says, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God, let's take this idea of the second coming and take it off the table. There's a second option. Some people think Jesus is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now this was truly a monumental event, but I think it's a stretch to see that act of judgment as the kingdom. It's a strange way to refer to apostate Israel being judged. That is never described as the kingdom elsewhere. Option three, some people think Jesus is referring here to his death, resurrection, and ascension. Maybe he's saying there are some standing here who will not taste death until I die as a sacrifice for sin on the cross, until I rise again on the third day, and until I send back up into heaven. Maybe, but nowhere else does scripture use the word kingdom to describe Christ's salvific work. Also, 11 of the 12 witnessed those things, everyone except Judas. So saying that some standing here will not taste death until I, rise, or until I die and rise and ascend, that doesn't seem to fit. That's a strange way to tell them that 11 of the 12 will see all of this happening. There's a fourth option, which is better. Perhaps Jesus is referring to Pentecost. Perhaps he's referring to that powerful scene in the early chapters of Acts where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the believers there in Jerusalem. That marks the birth of the church. It was a visible expression of God's power there at work in his people. But the church is not the fulfillment of the kingdom. As much as the church is to be an outpost of the kingdom, as much as we as the church are like little embassies of the kingdom of God, this is not the fullness of the kingdom. And once again, 11 of the 12 saw this event take place. They were there. So saying some will not taste death until you see this is a weird way to say Everyone except one traitor will be there for the birth of the church. So I really think the best explanation, option five, is that Jesus is actually referring to what takes place next. He's referring to the transfiguration. Right here in this immediate context, we have the fulfillment, the answer for what it is that Jesus is referring to in verse 27. There's a few reasons why. Jesus says, some are standing here who will not taste death until they see this. And there's only some who saw the transfiguration, only three. We're told that Peter and John and James were with Jesus when this took place. Before they tasted death, they got a little taste of the glory of Christ, a little glimpse into the majesty of the kingdom of God. And this emphasis on glory that we see here in in this passage on the transfiguration, the glory that, that Christ manifests, the glory that the disciples see, It ties in with all the emphasis on glory in verse 26. If you look back at verse 26, Jesus had said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels. This reference to the son of man, this reference to the glory of the father, this reference even to the glory of, of the angels and this reference to the kingdom of God, it is an emphasis on glory, 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 glory. And then what do the disciples see? They see glory. So I think this is tied together. This is a glory that would not be seen in Christ's death even a glory that's different than what is seen in his resurrection and ascension. It's a glory that's even different than what they would experience on the day of Pentecost. This is a weighty experience of glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
I also think that Jesus is referring to the transfiguration because in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Luke's gospel, they all three record the transfiguration immediately after this saying, immediately after this promise. And each of these three authors is very careful to give a time stamp. Notice what Luke says. He says about eight days after these sayings, he's linking them together. Matthew and Mark both say that after six days had passed. And, and they're just doing the math a little bit different. Matthew and Mark are, are referring to the six days that take place between the promise and the fulfillment, while Luke counts the day of the promise and the day of fulfillment. So there's no contradiction there. There's no error there with the math. But the point is that all of these authors are tying these two events together and giving it a precise timestamp. And you might ask, why is that? Why are they giving this detail? Often the gospel authors just say, sometime later, or and then, or and immediately, but rarely do they give specific timestamps like this. I think they're doing so to intentionally link this event with the saying of Jesus. Say, look, Jesus promised that this would happen, and then it happened. In addition, the divine statement from God points back to the previous section. Later, the divine voice from heaven in verse 35 says, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Listen to him. He's tying it back to everything Jesus has been saying, everything Jesus has been teaching. He's saying, listen to his revelation, his promises, his warnings, his instruction. This is another contextual link that ties this passage together with the one that comes right before it. So I know that's a bit of a a rabbit trail of a Bible study, but it's good for us. It, It helps us understand that God's word is true, and it is clear, and we can trust it. And I think this is the best understanding of what Jesus is referring to. But what I really want to spend time on today is why Jesus made this promise. Okay, we figured out, hopefully you're mostly with me as to what this means, but why did Jesus say this? Why did Jesus give them this experience? What is his aim? What is Jesus up to? To answer that why question, I think it's helpful to back up again and remember our context. Consider, first of all, the Messiah's message. Jesus came, we can see it in verse 18 through 27, as Jesus is explaining these things to them. They confess that he's the Christ, but then Jesus explained exactly what kind of Messiah he was, that the Christ came to suffer and die and rise again. He is a suffering Messiah. And this mission of Christ has implications for everyone who would follow him. He calls them to a life of self-denial, taking up their cross and following him. Now, this created a difficulty for the disciples. This is not what they expected. And it was probably confusing. They thought the Messiah would come in glory to drive out the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus had mentioned resurrection. He had mentioned the kingdom. He had mentioned his glorious return. But the disciples are stuck on this idea of the humiliation and the rejection that has to come first. They're stuck on this idea of even the cost of their own discipleship wrestling with how can this be and and is it worth it? And so at this key moment in the formation of his followers, think about what Jesus is doing here. The one who fed the crowds, remember the the 5,000 plus, and he feeds them with loaves and fishes. Now Jesus takes steps to feed their faith. He's aiming to strengthen their faith. He knows that in order to continue on this journey of discipleship, they need a vision of glory. And so Jesus graciously gives them a glimpse. He gives them an experience that would make a lasting impact on their faith. We find this glorious revelation in verses 28 through 31. After eight days, about eight days later, after these sayings took place, he takes Peter and John and James. They go up on the mountain to pray. Look at verse 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. While these three, these three that were closest to Jesus, this was the inner circle, his close friends, while they are with him on the mountain, Jesus is praying, they're taking a nap, something that tends to happen throughout the Gospels. But while they're there, there's this amazing moment where just for a few minutes, the veiled glory of Christ is unleashed. Luke, first of all, describes his appearance. He says that his face was altered. Matthew tells us in his gospel that it shined like the sun. 
Little kids, how many of your parents have told you, don't stare at the sun for too long, it'll hurt your eyes? Your parents ever told you that? If they haven't told you that, I'll tell you that today. Don't stare at it too long, okay? If you look at it too long, it'll actually hurt you. It's so bright, we can't look at the sun for very long. And Matthew says that Jesus' face was shining like the sun. That's amazingly bright. It's too much to look at directly. Mark says that Jesus was transfigured. The word is metamorpho, like where we get metamorphosis. You know how a caterpillar comes out of a cocoon and it's changed dramatically. There's this change that takes place. As his face is altered, he shines like the sun. And Luke also describes his clothing. He says his clothing becomes dazzlingly white. And dazzling doesn't mean sparkly. This is the same word that's used to describe lightning flashing forth. Have you ever had lightning shine like right in front of you? That's how Luke is describing his clothes. Mark describes his clothing as radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. When we think about Jesus' face and Jesus' clothes, what the gospel authors are describing is clearly a supernatural event. This is not just any Man, Jesus is special. When God reveals himself in scripture, it is almost always described as light. His glory shines. The the manifestation of who he is and what he is is described as brightness, so much so that in the Old Testament, when Moses saw his glory and then he came down from the mountain, Moses' face was shining. It was glowing just from being in the presence of the glory of God. So what the disciples are seeing right now here in this moment, they are seeing the glorious godness, if you could say it that way, of Christ, that he is God. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. You see, Jesus was not becoming something different in this moment. Jesus is not getting like a software upgrade and becoming something better than he was before the Mount of Transfiguration. No, Jesus didn't become glorious. He's always been glorious. He is who he has always been, and he is who he always will be. He's the Son of God. In John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus prays, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus has always been this glorious. So what happens here is just for a few minutes, the humble humanity of Jesus was suspended and his divine glory was allowed to shine through and it was blindingly glorious. But Luke not only describes his appearance, his otherworldly appearance, he also has some otherworldly companions. There's two people with him, Moses and Elijah. These two Old Testament saints, two of the greatest heroes of the faith, Moses had been personally buried by God somewhere up on a mountain. And Elijah never actually died that we know of. He was taken alive by God into heaven in this fiery chariot. So these are two pretty important characters in the Old Testament. And both of them had had experience with the glory of God on mountains. Moses had seen the glory of God in the burning bush. Elijah had encountered the glory of God on the same mountain. God had had tucked him into a little cave, and he had come before him. There was an earthquake. There was was a, a whirlwind. There was fire, but God was not in any of those things. Elijah hears this low whisper, what's often been called a still, small voice, and God spoke to Elijah on a mountain. So now these two are with Jesus, once again on a mountain, once again beholding the glory of God, and once again they are speaking with him. I think it's also significant that Moses and Elijah were there for two other reasons. You see, the people of Israel were expecting a prophet like Moses to come, but someone who would be greater. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses writes, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So Israel was expecting this future prophet who was even greater than Moses to come. And they were also expecting the prophet Elijah to return before the day of the Lord. And the prophet Malachi, we see this promise that that Elijah would return and that he would be sort of this symbol, this forerunner of the age to come, the kingdom that was going to be established. So these two men being there is incredibly significant. But I think it's interesting, they're not there to talk to the disciples. 
It's not recorded that they say anything to Peter, James, and John or that Peter, James, and John say anything to them. The attention of Moses and Elijah, these two great heroes of the faith, these two incredibly significant figures, their attention is all on Jesus. They're looking at him. They're talking to him. He is the better Moses who came to not just write the law, but fulfill the law. He is the ultimate prophet who doesn't just speak God's words to the people. Jesus is the living word, the word incarnate. Jesus isn't the one who prepares the way. He's the one who is the way and the truth and the life. So the ministries of these two men, Moses and Elijah, as great as they are, they're completely overshadowed and fulfilled by Jesus. So what are they talking to Jesus about? Well, Luke tells us. Verse 31 says that they appear with him in glory, and they spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They spoke of his departure. The Greek word here is literally the word exodus. Moses had been through an exodus before, but he's interested in what Jesus is about to do. He's interested in what Jesus is going to accomplish specifically at Jerusalem. You see, Moses and Elijah may have spoken for God in times past. They'd even spoken with God in times past. They had led God's people. These two men had performed great signs and wonders, but you know what they needed? These two men, as great as they are, they needed atonement. These men needed a sacrifice for their sins, something that no lamb and no bull could ever offer. These men needed a savior, and they're counting on Jesus. They're speaking with him. They're focused in on what he's about to accomplish at Jerusalem in his death, burial, and resurrection. Following this glorious vision, Peter makes a somewhat clumsy proposal in verse 32. Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they're not dreaming. This is not a vision. They are fully awake. They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then Luke says that Peter didn't know what he was saying. Peter opens his mouth, and he sort of ruins the moment. He's kind of a nervous talker. Uh, we're told elsewhere that these men were terrified, as usually people are when they behold the glory of God. Read your Old Testament, and you'll see that angels are always scraping people off the floor, picking them up again, because when they see the glory of God, they fall on their face. So Peter and these men are terrified. They're overwhelmed. And so Peter blurts out the first thing that comes to his mind. <laughs> and he says, hey, we should build some tents. Now, that might sound strange to our ears, and you might think, Peter, what are you talking about? That's dumb. But in Peter's mind, this made sense, and I think Peter gets a bad rap. He's often described as being sort of a bumbling idiot who's confused, but actually what Peter says is very, very intuitive. He knew what he was talking about. Peter was very in tune with some of these themes, Moses, Elijah, glory, mountain. It's like, hey, I've seen this movie before. I know what should happen next. Again, if we go back to Mount Sinai, the glory of God was revealed there on the mountain, and Moses had been there on that day. And you know what they did after this glorious revelation took place on the mountain with Moses? They built a tabernacle. They built a tent. And the reason they did that, in Exodus, and we see that in Exodus 19 through the end of the book, this, this building of the tabernacle, the giving of the law, the reason they built the tabernacle was so that the glory of God could dwell among them. So Peter goes, wow, this is the glory of God. We're on a mountain. Moses is here. Let's build some tabernacles so that we can preserve this moment. He wanted to bottle it up. He wanted them to not depart, but actually be able to stay. So I think it makes sense what Peter is saying. I think there also might be a little impulse for Peter saying, hey, you know what? This moment is glorious. Maybe we can skip that whole part about suffering and rejection and death. Maybe we can just capture the glory right now, and maybe, maybe you can lead us on a new exodus today. We'll take these tents with us. We'll drive out the Romans, and we'll establish the kingdom. That seems like a good idea, right? But Peter was missing the point. Jesus doesn't need a tabernacle. Jesus is the tabernacle. He is the indwelling presence of God with man. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus would later say that his body was the new temple. 
Jesus is the means by which God's glory comes to dwell with us. They don't need a tabernacle. In addition, Jesus' mission was to suffer and die and rise again. He wasn't there to drive out the Romans. He had told them that he must do this in verse 22. It is necessary. The Son of Man must be rejected. He must suffer many things. He must be killed. He must be raised on the third day. Moses and Elijah are talking about this mission. Jesus has already explained this mission to them, but it's going to take one more voice to drive the point home. And we see that voice in verse 34 and 35, a divine proclamation. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. This whole passage, this whole story is filled with allusions to Mount Sinai. We see three references here to the cloud. It reminds us of that thick cloud, that smoke that wrapped Mount Sinai, even the the pillar of cloud that, that went with them through the wilderness in their wandering years. And just like there at Mount Sinai, when there was a cloud, once again, God speaks from the cloud to his people. And notice what he says. He says, this is my son. This is an affirmation of the identity of Jesus, telling the disciples, look, you confessed him as the Christ, that's wonderful, but you need to know that he is even more than a Messiah. He is my son. He has a special relationship with me, which means he's not on the same level as Moses and Elijah. You wanted to build three tabernacles, but you need to recognize Jesus is set apart. He stands apart from Moses and Elijah. He is more than God's prophet. He is more than God's servant. He's even more than a Messiah. He is my son. He says, this is my son, my chosen one. My chosen one. This is a confirmation, not just of who Jesus is, but what he came to do. It's a confirmation of his mission. God the Father is telling the disciples that they need to recognize and receive the fact that Jesus has been appointed to a task. And that his task is to die and rise again, to bring salvation to God's people. Jesus had come to do the will of the Father. The disciples had a hard time with this. Peter, in the other Gospels, we're told, tells Jesus that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem and die on the cross. He doesn't like that plan. Here, Peter's like, maybe we can have a different plan. Maybe we can build some tabernacles. And God is saying, listen, this is my son, and he is my chosen one. I have appointed him to do my will. And then comes the directive. Having said that he is his son and his chosen one, God then directly commands these three. Can you imagine hearing a word from God like this? He says, listen to him. Listen to him. I had to wonder if Moses was nodding at this point. Again, Moses was the one who wrote back in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, It is to him you shall listen. So God says, listen. So we ask, well, listen to what specifically? Well, I think he's saying you need to listen to what Jesus has been trying to teach you. Listen to what Jesus has been trying to tell you about his death because they weren't listening. They were talking, and they were talking because they thought they had a better plan. They thought they had better ideas. They thought they had a better means of bringing about the fulfillment of God's promises. But God says, you need to listen to what my son is saying. You see, if Jesus doesn't die, there is no kingdom. If Jesus doesn't suffer, there is no redemption. If Jesus isn't rejected and despised, there will be no heaven, no kingdom, no glory for us. So they need to listen to what Jesus is saying. They need to receive it. They need to believe it. They need to embrace it as difficult and confusing as it might be. Then all of a sudden, as soon as all this happened, it was over. Verse 36, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. The cloud is gone. Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. Jesus is there, but now he looks the way that he always had. The voice of God, however, is still ringing in their ears. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. This event, this whole experience for these three, it was an incredible gift. 
This was a gift of God for them to get a taste of glory before they tasted death. And it was an amazing experience that they never forgot. John, who was there on the mountain, later would write this in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John never forgot. Peter, who was on the mountain that day, writes this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. These guys never got over that experience. They never forgot. It left a permanent mark on them, and it gave strength to their faith. It affirmed their confession that Jesus is the Christ. And it gave them hope that though Jesus was, yes, indeed, on the way to the cross, that the humiliation of his death would not be the end of the story. It was merely a prelude to glory, to exaltation, to resurrection, and ascension, and a return, and enthronement, and a kingdom. Those men had their faith strengthened that day. And I want our faith to be strengthened today as well. So how do we respond to all this? I want to give you three takeaways, three implications from this text. And I'll give them in the the form of some encouragement. So I want to encourage you today, first of all, to behold the glorious person of Christ. That's what you need. That's what I need. We need to behold the glorious person of Christ, to see him, to see his glory, because that is the medicine we need as well, to strengthen our faith. You might say, well, JD, that's great. Those guys got to see it. I haven't. I'm pretty sure you haven't either, and you're right. We haven't seen his glory like this. That's true. Jesus knows that. John 20, 29, he says to his disciples, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. But listen, there is another way to see There is a seeing with the eyes, yes, but there is also a kind of seeing that comes through faith. It comes by believing the word of God. That is the way in which we can see the glorious person of Christ. And consider what God said to the disciples on the mountain. Even they, the the ones who saw everything, what did God say? He did not say, this is my son, look at him. That's not what he said. He said, this is my son, my chosen one, Listen to him. Listen to his words. Listen to his teaching. Listen, the glory of Christ is seen when the word of Christ is believed. Did you catch that? The glory of Christ is seen when the word of Christ is believed. This is my son. Listen to him. Hebrews 1 says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the definitive word from God. And when we believe him, believe his word, we are beholding his glory. So we can't see what Peter, James, and John saw, but we do have the word of Christ. And actually, Peter later on would say that having the word of Christ, having the written word is even better and more sure than a physical experience of seeing the glory of Christ. Again, 2 Peter 1, 18 says, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. And Peter says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter says the prophetic word is even more sure than a personal experience. He says the prophetic word, just like the the person of Christ, radiates light. He says it's like a lamp shining to give light to us in a dark place. Listen, the glory of Christ is seen when the word of Christ is believed. We behold the glory of Christ's person 
when we see him in the scriptures. We see his divine essence and human nature in the scriptures. We see his attributes. We see his character in the scriptures. We see his works of power, and we receive his words of wisdom and instruction in the scriptures. At all times, our greatest need is to see Christ and behold his glory. And we see his glory as we receive his word. Behold the glory of Christ. See him in the word. Secondly, I want to exhort you today to embrace the glorious work of Christ. Embrace the glorious work of Christ. Jesus said that it was necessary in verse 22. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected be killed, and on the third day be raised. Moses and Elijah are intently focused on his departure. They're talking to him about it. The father confirms that Jesus is his chosen one, set apart for this task. We too must embrace the centrality of the cross. If the glory of Christ is the fuel for our faith, we behold that glory in his person, but we also need to embrace his glorious work. The glorious work of Christ is to save sinners through his death and resurrection. It's at the cross that we see the mercy and the justice of God. It's at the cross that we see the glory of his love for sinners. It's at the cross that we see the glory of Jesus' perfect obedience to the Father. It's on the cross that we see the glory of God's sovereign plan to save his children. Yes, the good news of the gospel is for the lost, If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ today, you need to come and repent of your sin and believe in Jesus. It is only the death of Christ that can save you. It is only by the power of his resurrection that you can have eternal life. But listen, this is good news for Christians too. It really is. In beholding the glory of his work, Christ's work, our faith is strengthened. The gospel is good medicine for Christians. Nothing else but the work of Christ can convince us of the Father's love. When you question whether you are loved by God, when you go through hardship and difficulty and doubt and suffering and you start to have this little small whispering in your ear, does God really love you? Look to the cross. That's the definitive answer. Nothing but the work of Christ gives us hope in the face of death, confident that we can go all the way to the finish line, that we can die well knowing what's on the other side for us. Only the gospel can give you that hope. Only the gospel can give you confidence to stand on judgment day, knowing that when everything is said and done and we die and we stand before a perfectly holy judge and we know our sin, we know our failures, you know what gives us confidence to stand in the day of judgment? The work of Christ. It is glorious. It is glorious. What else can convince us that God sovereignly works everything together for good? The most horrific evil that has ever been performed in this world, the murder of God's own son. God worked all that together for good to bring about our salvation. Can we trust him to work lesser things together for good? The things that we go through in our own lives? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, the word of the cross It's folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If you want to behold glory, behold the glorious work of Christ. That will strengthen your faith. When your faith is weak, when fear and doubt and apathy weary your soul, embrace the glorious work of Christ. And then finally, I want to urge you today to anticipate the glorious return of Christ. Anticipate the glorious return of Christ. Listen, we do not see him now, but we will. We will. And it won't be a little glimpse for a few moments. And it's not going to be seen by only a few. It will be seen by all, and it will continue for eternity. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him, no exceptions. We will see his glory coming with the clouds. Now, this is a warning for unbelievers. The returning Christ comes to crush his enemies with a rod of iron. He comes to judge the living and the dead. But the return of Christ is a comforting thought for true believers. And we need to anticipate that. We need to look to the glory of his return. Revelation 22.4 says that we will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. There's a personal 
experience and relationship with the risen Christ that we will enjoy for all of eternity. The Apostle Paul looks forward to this day. In Romans 8, 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul was looking to that glory. Jesus was encouraging Peter, James, and John to look ahead to that glory. We too need to look ahead to the glorious return of Christ. Jesus is coming back and his return means life and resurrection and joy and rest for all the saints. It meant these these things. This was the hope for Moses and Elijah. They were waiting for Jesus to do what he came to do so that they could have a resurrection body and, and enjoy the eternal kingdom. Peter, James, and John were waiting for this day. This was their hope as well. And it's the hope for every believer in this room. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope fully, not on yourself, not on another person, not in your strength and your money and your resources and your resourcefulness and your strength, not on the government, not on your church. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When our hope is set fully on the return of Christ, our faith is strengthened. So will you see his glory? Will you behold his glorious work? Will you anticipate his glorious return? I hope you will. If you find yourself at times like the disciples, overwhelmed, confused, fearful, when you feel the weight of the cost of discipleship, look to Christ. Look to Christ and let his glory be the fuel for your faith. May we continue to behold his glory in the word by faith until that day when we see him face to face. Would you pray with me?